Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for UNC Asheville's Q&A session with the Department of Social Sciences. My name is Flo Jacques, and I am an admissions counselor here at UNC Asheville. I do want to remind our audience that this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. But if you have any questions during the panel, I encourage you to please type them in the Q&A box, and we will answer those along the way. My favorite thing about hosting tonight's session is the opportunity to see a few of my former professors. I graduated from UNC Asheville Sociology and Teaching Licensure Program, so it's great to see Professor Cornett and Professor Underhill again. This evening, we have, a very, we have several very accomplished professors across various disciplines, including sociology, mass communication, political science, and psychology. Let's have the panelists introduce themselves. Dr. Underhill, can you start us off and then pick the next person after you're done? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Megan Underhill and I'm an assistant professor of sociology at UNCA. Um, so it's lovely to be here with you today. And I am going to have Linda, Dr. Linda Cornett introduce herself next. Thank you, Megan and Flo, nice to be here. Uh, my name is Linda Cornett. I'm the chair of political science and uh, the director of undergraduate research. I've been here forever, uh, about 25 years, so I'll just leave it at that. And um, Mike. All right, let me unmute myself. I apologize. Thank you. My name is Mike Nealon. Um, I'm an associate professor in the psychology department. I've been here, I guess, somewhere in between um, Megan and Linda. I've been here about 15 years. Um, uh, and so I teach a number of courses uh, related to neuroscience, cognitive psychology, statistics, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the psych department. And so I will now ask Stephanie to introduce herself. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you. I'm Stephanie O'Brien. I'm a lecturer in the mass communication department. Um, I guess I'm the, I've been here, the, I'm, I'm working on my fourth year at um, UNCA and um, loving every minute of it. Uh, I teach courses across, across the spectrum of mass communication and uh, particularly at the intersection of cultural studies, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about mass comm as well. So thrilled to be here. It's great to see everyone. Amazing. Thank you again for being here. So we do have a, a series of questions submitted by the students tonight. Um, our first question is, what are some of the most popular social science courses offered at UNC Asheville? Well, in my department, I think some of the most um, popular courses are um, so sociology of race, queer sociology, um, social movements, and health and illness. Um, sorry, Mike, do you wanna go ahead? Oh, that's fine. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, psychology is generally, um, we have the largest number of majors, so we're a pretty popular major. Um, even so, our class sizes are not particularly large. It's one of the advantages of UNC Asheville. So even our intro psych class, I think, is about 40 some students. Um, but many of our majors or people who are interested in majoring in psych come in already with intro psych. So you wouldn't even take a class that large here. So even though psych and, and many of these other majors are very popular, um, our class sizes are very manageable. Um, I'll echo that as well. I'd say one of the courses in Mass Comm, because it's also part of our liberal arts core, um, is Mass Comm 104, which is Media, Ethics, and Society, uh, which is a course that I teach, which is really popular. Um, and we offer several sections a semester for it because it also uh, meets uh, your social sciences requirement in the LAC. And it's just a great sort of course that looks at so much of the intersection of media um, and like it says, media ethics and society, but we have so much that we talk about just constantly changing. But like Mike said, uh, the course is, you know, capped at only like 25 students and it's a great uh, just interactions and discussions that we have as well. I'd say some of the other courses we have that are really popular are some of our um, introductory to film classes, our journalism, uh, data journalism classes, particularly our social media um, and public relation classes as well uh, are quite popular. 
Um, and and, and uh, a lot of those, particularly the, the introduction to film, my cultural studies and media class, those are open to, to students across the spectrum uh, in, in any courses that they're taking at UNCA, any majors. And I'll just add to that, um, of course, political science is the most popular topic in the world. Uh, well, should be. Um, and our classes, uh, the intro classes are always popular, especially the intro to American politics, but also the intro to international relations, because these are kind of the gateway courses to a lot of other courses, not just in our department, but for example, uh, fulfills requirements in other majors, minors, and uh, core curriculum. So in just in terms of numbers, those are probably the classes that have the most students. But again, like everybody else, we cap them at 22 to 25. Um, and I wouldn't presume though to do, to try to identify which are the classes that are most popular at the upper division, because it really depends upon student interest. So a lot of our students come because they have interest in law. And for them, the law classes at all levels are really interesting. But those with interest in international relations, you know, will gravitate toward international relations and comparative politics. Um, we have a, a special interest in our department in human rights, both of, uh, in the US context, but also at the international context. And, and those classes are, are very popular. Uh, and some service learning classes too, because that is where, um, you know, people see the intersection between what they're studying in the classroom and what they care about in their lives. So. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Amazing, thank you. Um, well, what are some of your favorite courses to teach? I'll start if that's okay. Um, all of them, <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I love all of them. Um, I would say in particular because, so I'll give two, um, well, the media ethics and society I've already talked about, but my interests lie um, at cultural studies where cultural studies and media intersect. So particularly representation in media. So that class is a diversity intensive um, uh, as well. And so um, that's a really interesting class where we look at all forms of, of media um, and representation in particular. I'd say the other one is, is video production, basic video production, which we get students also. I, I have students right now from um, Megatronics in there and from Atmospheric Sciences because they just, they like the idea and know that now we do so many things through visual storytelling and that what that class is based on, teaching uh, the basics of visual storytelling. Um, and because we see so much convergence of media and careers, right, in terms of putting things out on social media to promote um, the work that everyone does, we have a lot of students in the basic video production class, and it's a lot of fun, I have to say. We do commercials and nonfiction and fiction and all kinds of great things. Anyone else want to share their favorite course to teach? Well, I'll say that, uh, you know, one of the courses I teach uh, every year um, and for a long time taught every semester was the Intro to International Relations. Um, and even though it's an introductory course, uh, and I've taught it for decades now, uh, it's always interesting because uh, even as the kind of basic theories and concepts, perspectives on international relations change very slowly, the actual day-to-day uh, -day events uh, change fast. And that means there's always something going on in the world that we can talk about in um, international relations. And even though I've taught it so many times, it's kind of interesting and fun to see new students learning it. Um, you know, sometimes being exposed to some of these things for the first time, just like I was uh, when I went into college and had never really been exposed to international uh, relations. It, and suddenly found it uh, you know, a whole new world for me. But a couple of other things uh, that I think is pretty unique to UNC Asheville is we are able to offer a lot of special topics, um, either, either as big classes or as independent studies or undergraduate research. And so for the last uh, decade or so, I've been teaching an undergraduate research in human rights class where uh, I actually train students to code uh, US State Department human rights reports. And uh, when we, we do that for every country every year um, and then we publish those results and uh, they're used by a variety of scholars but also activists uh, and policymakers. 
And then the one other thing, which is a little unusual, is we have a human rights studies minor. It's housed in the political science department, but it draws classes from all over the, the curriculum. And so the last couple of years, the students have actually led um, a, an effort to produce uh, an undergraduate human rights journal, uh, soliciting um, contributions from not only UNCA, but across the UNC system and across the disciplines. And they actually do the whole thing, put it together, make a website, uh, take the submissions, peer review, publish, and write some original content themselves. This is, I think, uh, pretty remarkable. And I wish I could take, uh, take credit for it, but really it, this has been done by the students and I just kind of uh, provide the classroom space. And I just would like to add to that, one of my favorite courses to teach is the senior seminar in sociology. Um, and this is a course where students are engaged in undergraduate research which I think is another hallmark of what UNCA offers is hands-on research experience for students. And so for a lot of sociology students, um, um, in particular, those that work with me, they're engaged in qualitative research. So they're going out and interviewing folks, they're immersing themselves in particular communities around the city, and then they're um, leading their own project on it for over a semester. And then at the end, um, writing a report. And it's so amazing to me to see these students blossom over the semester and to see how deeply engaged they become with their research. And I think one of the other special things that many of the folks on this call have touched on is that, um, you know, professors have um, a deeply, they're deeply committed to the students and work very closely with them. So um, not only do students have the opportunity to submit to um, the Human Rights Journal, um, but there's also another undergraduate research journal that students can commit to uh, submit to. There's a um, conference, an undergraduate research conference that UNCA hosts. Um, and then there are a number of, of other professors throughout the university who take students with them um, to professional associations. So for instance, um, Flo has presented at a um, professional Southern, the Southern Sociological Society as a student. Um, and, and, that's fairly rare for undergrads. Um, it's something that typically happens when, when you're in graduate school or you're a professor. So um, because this is such a small school and because of the liberal arts focus, these are some of the um, really unique opportunities that, you, that students at UNCA have. Thank you for that. And Dr. Underhill, um, I, the relationship I had with you as a professor is definitely um, a prime example of the kind of cool um, opportunities in the personalized experience our students can get here because um, you connected me to so many professional development opportunities. I would have never known about that so, um, Southern Sociological um, Society Conference had you not shared that with me. So I'm very grateful for that and that I have on my resume now. But um, thank you. Any other um, advice that we would like um, uh, share our teach our favorite uh, course that we would like to teach, Dr. Nealon? I, I I mean I would just echo what what Megan was saying that um, the opportunity to do undergraduate research is one of the I think primary appealing things about UNCA that you know, you get to work with your professors. We don't have graduate students, so we need the help of undergraduates to do our work and and you can get easily involved in that. And there's many majors that have ways of getting their students to in, be involved in undergraduate research. It's a great opportunity to be able to get your foot in the door and you're not competing with postdocs and graduate students in giant labs. So it's a really great opportunity. And maybe I, I would add to that. I, it seems like I should have brought that up, too, shouldn't I have? Uh, that one of the things we, we're finding in a lot of the uh, departments now is that there's an understanding that um, we really need to be able to pay students uh, to be able to make the commitment to undergraduate research because it is a commitment and we don't want to leave people out because they've got to work off of campus. And so one of the things I've seen in the last couple of years in particular is especially our younger students, I mean our younger faculty who have startup money are uh, hiring some paid research assistants to help them in their own work. And in the process, they again get that really invaluable uh, experience. And the, the symposium that uh, I think Megan was talking about, we have one in spring and fall of every year and we get somewhere between 200 and 350 students participating in that from across the campus. And we shut down all classes for that day so that everybody can participate. 
Thank you. Um, so our next question is, what would the human rights studies minor entail? What might this look like alongside a political science major? Right, and it is a very popular combination. So one of the things that we think is um, a, uh, a real advantage for the political science major is it's not a big major. Uh, you know, 38 credits that are required, 34 in political science plus STAT 185, which also counts for the quantitative reasoning uh, requirement. So that means that students have an opportunity and we really encourage them to do uh, a second major or uh, a minor or study abroad um, and you know those kinds of things. So we have a lot of students who are doing some combination and political science and undergraduate research are very, um, are very common match um, for, for students. So they do their 38 um, credit hours, mostly political science and political science. And the, then the, the minor you know, would be uh, uh, 19 credit hours drawn from a selection of intro courses that cross the curriculum and also then a selection of um, 300 and 400 level courses all about uh, human rights from different perspectives from the perspective of philosophy uh, from the perspective of uh, u.s civil rights uh, and, and a, a variety of other perspectives as well one thing if i can uh, i don't know uh, push it a little bit is we have a pretty um, unique uh, program just started this year, which uh, political science majors can um, pursue a dual degree. So they can uh, complete all of their liberal arts core and most of their political science uh, requirements here at UNCA for the first three years. And then uh, join the master's or LLM program in human rights at Essex University in uh, the United Kingdom and they get a degree, political science degree from UNCA and uh, a graduate degree from Essex pretty much at the same time. Uh, Essex approached us because we had been sending great students and they thought why not formalize this and so we really feel uh, both proud of our students and um, you know, delighted that we're able to offer this pretty unique uh, option but I know that lots of people are starting to think about the ways that they can um, combine their own majors with, with other opportunities. Awesome. Um, so let's talk about a little um, some of the internship opportunities in each department. Let's start with the mass communication department. I think that was one of our main questions in the chat here and that they've sent in earlier. Yeah, thanks. So I, I typed up some there um, about it as well, but we have a lot of great internship um, opportunities and I'm always stressing to my advisees how important I think these are. We have an internship class um, as well where you can learn resume building and, and um, professional communication and networking and it really helps you sort of um, find an internship and then and then move through that internship throughout the semester. But so some examples that students have done, Blue Ridge Public Radio, the Asheville Art Museum in terms of like their social media and marketing um, as well. We have actually students in UNCA's communication and marketing uh, um, division at UNCA doing internships also. Um, we have students that will work for small uh, production companies in um, at around Asheville and Buncombe County also um, doing either narrative or commercials. Uh, we have students that work for nonprofits doing their social media uh, as well. So it just, it's, you know, it, media is such a convergent media now. You have to have all these sort of skill sets, particularly to do it, that there's so many different ways um, that a student can get an internship. I also mentioned in the chat that our career center is fantastic. They have a I call it a site, I don't know what to call it, but it's called Handshake. And it's a way in which students can find um, internships that are out there as well as jobs, right? Um, um, while they're in school. And so um, all our internships have to go through Handshake and then students can, can um, apply for them that way. And then I also mentioned that every summer, Professor Slatten in our class does the 48 hour film festival. So Professor Slatten takes a group of students out and they do the very fun 48 hour film festival and uh, they've won all kinds of awards every year. They always get something. So that's another great opportunity too. So um, that's a bit, uh, you know, um, overview. But I also have students, I have to say, who already work somewhere 
Um, and I tell them, I said, ask your boss if they need help doing the social media sites, right? If they need help in, in their marketing areas or something like that, or if they're going to make a commercial, can you work on it? So there's just so many opportunities to find a way, especially in, in media um, for internships. Uh, I'll jump in and, and add that the psychology has a senior seminar that um, provides internship opportunities for the students who are interested in what we generally call the helping profession. So if you're interested in going on to become a therapist or a counselor, um, get a master's degree in, it could be in, you know, school counseling or marriage counseling or um, social work. Uh, we have a senior seminar where we place our students into organizations in the community where they work, I think, up to 90 hours over the semester at that organization, along with their coursework. Um, and it's an incredible experience for them and also a great resume builder for their applications to graduate school. Um, and so that's, you know, our focused uh, way of getting internship opportunities for our students. But I would second what Stephanie says that the Career Center has lots of opportunities as well for students to find internships. Um, I'm going to put into the the chat here um, the uh, the our web page here for the seminar, the senior seminar in psychology for those students who might be interested in clicking on that and reading more about it. Okay. Um, so on that note, uh, what psychology, um, what is the experience of a student studying psychology on a pre-med track? Um, maybe you might want to add a little bit more there, um, even though you just add that link. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an important question. Uh, we do have a number of students who are interested in um, going on into medical school. Uh, there was a question in, in the Q&A actually about psychiatry. Um, and psychiatry is a medical degree rather than psychology. So if you're interested in psychiatry, then you would actually need to go on and get a medical degree or an MD. So we do have a number of students that do that. There are, as you can imagine, a number of uh, prerequisites that you need to take in order to you know, make sure you're ready to get into med school. And then you have to take these special exams called the MCATs to get in med school. So you have to prepare for those as well. So I think being a major in psychology and being pre-med is certainly doable. It is a little more work in some ways, because if you're already, I think, a natural science major, like a chem major or biology major, you can imagine that many of the courses you have to take for those majors also do double duty as the pre-health or the pre-med requirements. Whereas if you're a psych major, then you're taking something a little bit extra. Um, however, I think the, the MCATs have actually added a social science component to their test. So they have questions now about psychology and sociology. I think this is their push towards emphasizing public health and emphasizing the sociological nature of health. So. Um, it's actually useful to, to take courses in psychology and sociology in order to prepare you for that component of the MCAT. So it's certainly not a bad idea to be a, a psych major and, and be pre-health or pre-med. Um, another possibility that might also overlap between those two interests is we have a neuroscience minor on campus that's closely related to psychology, sort of sprang out of psychology but it is its own independent uh, minor. And I think it's housed in the interdiscipl in interdisciplinary studies department. Um, but it also overlaps heavily with all of the you know, pre-med requirements. So what you might find if you're interested in neuroscience and you wanna be a neuroscience minor and a psychology major, being pre-health or being pre-med is not going to, you. I don't think you have to add too much more on top of that. And you would probably already be ready to take the MCATs and be pre-med. So I think that's a great way to try to, you know, satisfy your interest in psychology and medical school might be by pursuing that sort of neuroscience minor track as well. Um, and that would help you with the pre-med requirements. I did um, also pull up the webpage for the, our pre-health advisory committee or pre-health advisory page. I'm also adding that to the chat if anyone wants to click on that and look at that further. Great, thank you. Um, in your opinion, this might be a question for Dr. Underhill more so, in your opinion, what is the best reason for studying sociology and how will this area of study help students improve the world around them? Oh my gosh. Um, first of all, sociology is just so wonderful. It's so fascinating. I know I'm biased, but um, 
People who are interested in sociology are really interested in issues of social justice and social inequality. And um, that's one of the things that sociology really brings to the table is that um, you're looking at um, gender inequality and class inequality and racial inequality. And you're thinking about um, how these systems of stratification developed over time, how they've changed, how they impact people's lives, um, but not uh, only are you thinking about these um, systems, right, but you are also studying and researching how people are, are pushing against this, right, how people are mobilizing in their individual lives and collectively to create change. And so I think that sociology provides us with the tools to make sense of this very complicated world that we live in now. Um, that is really rife with all kinds of inequality. Um, so it helps us make sense of that and it helps us think of, think of strategies um, that are rooted in, in research and applied methods for creating change in our communities. Um, so for those reasons, I would say, come be a sociology major. I'm heavily oh. biased also. Oh, I'm so sorry, go ahead. That's okay. But if you want to affect change, you almost always have to go through the political system one way or the other. And so I tell my students who come to my environmental politics class, they come because they're interested in the environment. But I tell them, if you want to be an effective environmentalist, you've got to be a good political scientist as well, because you have to understand the political process and what it takes to go from ideas about how you'd like to change the world to actually affecting that change through public policy. Now, obviously, people can affect change through their individual lives and you know outside of the political system, uh, but a knowledge of political institutions and processes uh, I think is is uh, indispensable for for people who would also like to change the world. Awesome, um, and I I definitely love and appreciate all subject areas in the social sciences department. I started off at UNC Asheville in the psychology department because I thought I wanted to become a therapist, and I switched over to sociology because I like to define it like this: um, the sociology focuses on how the world impacts the individual, and psychology focuses on how the individual impacts the world. So, if any of you students out there are considering the difference really between sociology and psychology that might be able to help narrow that down there. But we do have a follow-up question. Um, it's a student asked, what is the overall experience of what it's like to become a social worker through the sociology program at UNC Asheville? That's a great question. Uh, we don't specifically offer any um, social work classes per se, but I think all of our classes um, inform social work as a practice, um, not only by studying these systems of inequality um, and how individuals and, and larger collectives are affected by them and how they affect them. Um, but also um, we have a lot of internships in our program. So every spring we have an internship class and students um, go and work for um, justice oriented nonprofits. So um, Pisgah Legal is one. Pisgah Legal helps um, people who are on the brink of becoming evicted from their homes. So it helps them to become um, a, a housing secure. Um, they also work with a lot of folks who are immigrants and some of whom are undocumented, um, negotiate those, um, those hoops. Um, in addition, people work for places like Homeward Bound. Homeward Bound um, works with unhoused folks in, in the area, helping them to um, try to become housing secure um, because housing security is associated with um, upward mobility. Um, and they work for a place called Bounty and Soul. This is another one. And this is um, a food nonprofit organization that works with um, immigrant agricultural workers. So um, these are, are some of the ways that I think that our students are getting um, social work-esque experience, um, even though we don't specifically offer social work classes. That said though, many of our students go on to pursue master's degrees in social work. And um, I'll also add that a lot of our psych students also go on to get masters in social work as well. So that's another very popular. In fact, for our students who go on to graduate programs, masters in social work MSWs are the most popular choice 
Um, and, you know, as Megan was describing, social work is a very broad field, and I think they would describe it as having different levels depending on what you're interested in concentrating on. You can concentrate on at what they call the macro level, which sounds like working in the community and working with organizations and getting resources for, you know, large number of people or community organizations. But then there's also down at what they call the micro level, which is when you're working with individuals. And at that point, um, another route to becoming an individual therapist is through getting a master's in social work and then becoming what is called a licensed clinical social worker. So for those of you who are interested in sort of the combination of social work and therapy, that is a very popular route. We have a lot of our majors that pursue that route. Awesome. Um, so our next question does ask, what is the history program like and how does it compare to other colleges in North Carolina, if anyone wants to take that one? Well, I, I don't think I'm qualified. I'm sorry to answer the question. I know they're fantastic. I love them, but sorry, Linda, if you know more. That's okay. Because it's 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 a tricky thing because history is sometimes uh, in the social sciences and at UNC Asheville it's considered in the humanities. Uh, so we don't interact as much, even though from a political science perspective, history is a prerequisite to understanding politics. Uh, uh, but they're also quite distinct. So so I wouldn't want to speak for them. They they've got a very uh, big and and uh, really diverse. Um, department in terms of their their expertise and their interest and in, uh, where they go with that. I will add, um, although I did not major in history, I did take a couple courses. Um, along with my sociology degree, I did get my high school social studies teaching license. And that's one of the unique things that sets UNC Asheville apart um, among several other UNC institutions. Um, our teacher licensure program allows you to major essentially um, in your concentration area and then add a licensure. And so um, for me, if you're in the uh, sociology or economics or political science or history realm, you get a social science, um, social studies licensure. And so that experience did um, enable me to take some history courses. And I loved my history professors. Um, the humanities dwells a lot on um, history also, and I really loved those. So um, that's definitely an experience that I encourage students to take a look at on our website. If you just Google history UNC Asheville, um, it'll take you to our history website and you'll be able to take a look at the curriculum, some of the content we cover, a concentrations offered. So you can um, choose to major in history or add a licensure. I like to look at it as if you're building two careers at once. It doesn't really add on extra time, nor does it cost extra money. Um, and so those are some opportunities there. So um, that's a really good question. Any other additions to this subject? No. Okay, so we will move towards some of the questions that we have in the chat. Um, one does fall back to one that we kind of answered earlier, but does uh, this student wants to know if a student is interested in international studies concentration within the interdisciplinaries major, is this housed in social sciences, humanities, or both? Well, uh, I'll speak to that. I was uh, once in a previous life, the uh, director of international studies, and um, it is housed, again, it's interdisciplinary, so it's kind of arbitrary where it is housed, uh, but here we've housed it in the social sciences, but it draws from, uh, you know, across the disciplines as well, inter um, international studies. And so, you know, there's there's economic uh, development and uh, aid, and there's of course international law, international organization development, uh, uh, the the uh, sociology. I know that there's uh, social movements in Latin America, so it, it draws from across uh, the curriculum. But, but we, we just kind of arbitrarily house it in in the social sciences. Awesome. Any other additions? Were you going to say something, Dr. Nguyen? No. Okay. <laughs> Our next question says, are there sociology courses that touch on animals and society? Wow, that is so cool. There are not yet. 
Um, but I will say this is, I know that this is a growing um, field of study within, within sociology. Um, so there could well be soon, and I think there would be if there was enough student interest. So again, another thing about being at a, a small school like um, UNCA is that when there are um, some students who articulate an interest in a subject, um, it's very possible for faculty members to put together a course um, in a future semester. So there isn't one now, but that isn't to say that there won't be one. So um, thanks for that suggestion. Yeah. The good thing about going, attending a, a smaller institution like UNCA is that they're always open to hearing feedback and what the students are interested in. Um, so we'll definitely leave room for that. Um, so uh, we have another question specifically for Dr. Cornette. Um, would you say that students interested in political activism congregate in your classes? And if so, what is that like? Yes, I would say so. And, and of course, just like uh, the students who come to my environmental class, they're interested in the environment. Uh, but then, you know, we, we persuade them that they need to understand the politics. Uh, but it's really like that with all of our classes. The students come not because, you know, they're interested in political theory as much, although there is a political theory, you know, section that, that uh, has its adherence. But many of them come because they're interested in uh, affecting political change. Uh, and the thing that we do in all of our classes is to try to bring the tools of political science to that effort. Uh, so it's one thing to kind of want to see change, but change does not happen spontaneously because it would be good or you'd like it. It happens with uh, political mobilization and again, understanding uh, the role of various groups in the political process, in the institutions, the rules, um, also the theory though, and the methods too. So we just uh, bring the tools of political science to that interest. And um, so our, our students come just because they're, they're, they're passionate about politics, but we hope that they leave with some additional tools to make those, um, those passions uh, uh, accessible to them. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we do have a question kind of going back to a, uh, a topic we've mentioned. Would, would majoring in sociology and minoring in psychology um, when becoming a licensed clinical therapist be an option or is it the other way around? Does it matter the order somebody may choose to major or minor between those subject areas if their path is uh, pursuing clinical mental health? Mike, I'm going to let you take a stab at that first, since you know about clinical mental health. <laughs> um, yeah, what I would say is I'm actually not a, um, on the clinical side of things, but um, certainly this is a very popular area for our majors. And um, what I would say for what I had mentioned earlier, I'd mentioned what is called a, li a licensed clinical social worker. So you get your master's in social work and then you have to put in a number of hours and then take a, you know, a, a licensure exam and then you would get the ability to practice basically as a therapist. Um, social work master's degrees, I think can accept students from many different backgrounds. So I, you know, a lot of our majors do go on to master work uh, programs, but I don't think you need to be a psych major to do that. You could be sociology major, you could be health and wellness. Um, I think there's a lot of flexibility in that. And I don't think that any of the, you know, it's not quite like pre-med or, or uh, a particular physical therapy where they might require some anatomy course or something very specialized. I don't think there's any specialized requirement for a master's in social work. So I think you would have a lot of flexibility to choose your major. I think sociology would certainly be part of it. Um, and, and then I think what they would look for more is your commitment to practicing in that field so have you volunteered in settings that are relevant for what you're interested in? Have you done internships? So I think the practical experience for that kind of um, master's program would be essential. Whereas in a PhD program, I would say maybe the more important thing would be undergraduate research experience. So that's probably what is more important for those master's programs rather than specific coursework. Excellent. Um, so our next question asks, what behaviors do you notice and appreciate from your students? Uh, 
I can I can start if that's all right. I I would I mean a sense of inquiry, like wanting to know more, right? Wanting wanting uh, to be open to learn things that we didn't that we haven't even thought about, maybe, um, and um, and and being. Um, I just I love students who are just sort of open for discussion and ideas and and just thinking, you know, I hate to see use the cliche outside the box, but just thinking about things that maybe, you know, we hadn't we wouldn't think about if we weren't in such an interdisciplinary setting, which I have to say is so much about what I love about hearing everything is just UNCA is such a place where you can explore so many things um, in so many ways. And I think being open to exploration. Um, and, and sometimes of things that make us uncomfortable, right, uh, as well, um, is, is a big thing for me. And I, I love seeing that in students. I love seeing students that want to open themselves up to new and exciting adventures. You know, I was thinking exactly that same thing. And I, I, I was thinking of it in terms of intellectual curiosity, um, because I, I think students sometimes think they're going to college to learn all the answers. And uh, I think we're trying to show them that they're going to college to question <laughs> things that they thought they knew. And uh, that's not to say you just give up the things that you believe, but just to be open to different ideas rather than kind of thinking you know the truth and being unwilling to look beyond the, the narrow, um, you know, whatever path that you've been on. So those are the students that I, I think see really grow um not just you know get more skilled uh which we, we we also hope that students do in the process but to really grow in intellectually and also personally and professionally as well because they see um they see more uh options than they would if they just stayed in a fairly narrow path that they may have started on and i would just add to that that one of the things that i really appreciate about this environment of intellectual curiosity is that it really cultivates an atmosphere of enthusiasm in a lot of classrooms. And so again, um, because UNCA classes are really small, um, 20 to 25 students, um, you can have a discussion-based class as an, uh, um, in these undergraduate classes. And so it really gives people a chance to um, flesh out topics. And often what happens is that um, these become really excited conversations where um, you can, get a sense of people feeling really passionate about something and um, it's energizing. It's just wonderful. Um, so I think that's another aspect of um, what Stephanie and, and Linda said and just um, the structure of, of UNCA. And one thing I'll note is that I really appreciate about our students is we can have students from very different backgrounds um, I know that in my classes, I often have a lot of older students, students who are returning to school um, or getting a new degree, and they bring some really interesting perspectives. So, you know, the class sizes, as Megan said, are very small. You can't hide in the class, but that also means that you're going to be exposed to ideas and, and learn things from people who have different backgrounds and experiences. Some people are working while they're in school and some people have, you know, traveled between school and coming back. And um, there might be people from a military background or other backgrounds as well. And, and those provide lots of really interesting perspectives in those discussions. So I really appreciate that about our students. Um, you know, it's not a very narrow slice of, I think, life and I, I appreciate that there's no sense of entitlement. I think that that's something that I really like in our students is that they're they're eager to learn, and um, and so there, you know there's no whining or complaining or anything like that. Even if things are hard and, and sometimes there's challenges, um, I really appreciate that, that about UNCA students. Absolutely. I think as we, I've been listening to you guys, uh, uh, one of my favorite memories of being in the sociology department just came to mind. Um, so as with many departments, we have something called Chocolate Tuesdays. And I love it because there's free chocolate and it's the good kind of chocolate like Ghirardelli and Lindor, but also because these workshops really um, are tailored to give you a variety of information that you might need to know about the 
respective field, such as if you want to go to grad school, some of the grad school options I learned there from one of our uh, professors, Dr. Hewitt, that you might not always need to pay to pursue a PhD, that there's funding opportunities, which I had no idea about, um, and other career paths that might be available to you in the sociology department. So um, that's kind of something I want to throw out there so students understand that when you get here, you're not just, you know, thrown in. There are workshops and sessions and definitely chocolate to entice you to learn more about the opportunities available to you um, in your respective department. Um, so we do have more questions, but before we navigate to that, I do want to ask, um, so over 70% of our students conduct undergraduate research at UNC Asheville. What are some cool undergraduate research projects that you've seen during your time at UNCA? Um, well, I'm happy to start. Um, that is absolutely one of the things that I, I love about being at UNCA is working with undergraduates on projects and uh, and what I you know this is a little bit of inside baseball but you know when you go to a larger university um, the professors there are very concerned about their careers because they have to be in order to get promoted and keep their jobs so they're they need to make sure that they're publishing or doing work that is going to be have an impact or respected by their peers and that means they have less time to explore interesting new ideas maybe that just kind of crop up. Whereas one nice thing about UNC Asheville, even though we do have excellent scholars, we do have the opportunity and we're rewarded, I think, for working with undergraduates on novel projects that maybe they helped to devise. And it's not necessarily going to lead to a paper or a book, but it's something new. And I really enjoy that component. And so one of the new projects that I've gotten involved in recently, and it's with students from the engineering mechatronics program, um, is using so it's a it's a great example of interdisciplinarity. We're using a um, a remote or a, a, an EEG cap that records brain signals in order to try to control a robotic arm remotely without having to move your arm necessarily just using your thoughts. So there's lots of moving parts to that there's the recording of the EEG side, which is my background and experience. And then once you get those recordings, um, the, there's people in the computer science side of things who are taking that to try to train an artificial neural network to recognize those brain signals and understand, oh, you're thinking about moving this and you're thinking about moving this. And then there's the engineering side, which is now you got to make the robot arm take those commands and move. Um, so that, it's such a great example of working across to uh, departments, and that's not a project that I've ever been involved in before, kind of applying the EEG component to something uh, practical like that. It's called brain computer interface, but I'm very excited about working on that and, and uh, you know, inventing our own Dr. Octopus. That's what I keep saying to <laughs> our engineering professor. He's going to put on his pack and have his robotic arms soon. <laughs> I'll mention, sorry, one thing that um, I know Dr. De Palma this semester, um, who works in our social media and sort of uh, public relation courses, is working with students uh, doing research into broadband expansion um, in Western North Carolina, um, uh, working with the Land of Sky, I think, um, on that as well. And I'll just mention, I've had a couple of students who have done research like on the TV series Pose and, and queer representation. Um, in that I've had students do research on cultural appropriation. So these have all been sort of presented either at, at undergraduate research day. Um, my students um, uh, uh, work on Pose was um, published in the undergraduate research journal. So, you know, there's various kinds of ways in which uh, across, and we do some data journalism research as well with Dr. Meadows. So I'll just sort of condense it into that. Yeah, and I've had um, students do some really cool projects um, related to the pandemic. So for instance, last semester, I had a student who uh, went and interviewed pharmacists and pharmacy tech workers um, about their experience working as essential frontline workers during the pandemic and um, the effects that that has had on their um, on their mental well-being. So that's one um, cool project. Another project that I really admired was um, there was a student who wanted to study um, there's a, a subculture of, of people in the in the US, I learned from her, um, who um, are 
are financially insecure, um, but not, not, they're not, um, before they're, they're, they're elderly and financially insecure and they buy RVs. Um, and, um, they, they go around traveling around the country, um, going to different RV parks and being in community with, um, other folks. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining it, but she bought an RV and then went and um, started hanging out with some of these folks for about six months. And she um, did the most beautiful ethnography um, and, and also sort of a, um, a video ethnography, a documentary of what this was like. Um, her project was just, um, it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. So um, those have been some of, of the projects that I've been really inspired by. Well, I'll, I'll say one that's not mine. Uh, we have quite a few faculty members, all of our all of our majors in political science are required to do an, an original undergraduate research project as a demonstration of senior competency. So we have four faculty members just that regularly rotate through. So we get all the different kinds of uh, fields, American, international, uh, human rights, law, but we also get different methods, qualitative and quantitative. And one of our newer faculty members uh, that's taking advantage of some of this interdisciplinarity um, in the social sciences. And he teaches a class on politics and the mind. And it is co, I mean, it is a, uh, what do we call that? It's also presented with cr Cross-listed in psychology. It's cross-listed in psychology. So it's drawing from both fields. And one of the things that motivated him is he was doing research on how people's uh, perception of gender conformity uh, that influence their perceptions of politicians and how that also influenced whether those politicians were getting funding. Uh, and so it was a really interesting thing which involved him, it, he called it the Faces Project, getting pictures of various politicians and then lining them up with these expectations of gender um, conformity and then seeing how those things match with other things uh, uh, in terms of their funding, in terms of the committee appointments and all kinds of things you wouldn't have thought of. And I always thought that was the greatest thing and I wish I'd thought of it, but uh, not being a political psychologist, that was kind of a, a problem. But one thing I did with one of my students is we, we used the US State Department human rights reports uh, to look at human rights practices across the globe. Uh, but the one big drawback on that is the United States State Department does not produce um, an annual report on itself. So our students produced a shadow report for the United States using exactly the template uh, that the United States uses for every other country in the world. And it was a, a really eye-opening experience for her. And we tried to replicate that year after year so that we're, we're trying to uh, reproduce a little bit uh, of that resource, but with the United States under the microscope instead of every other country. Awesome. Um, uh, undergraduate research was one of my favorite experiences. Um, the cool thing that a lot of students don't know and might be really good for our audience to know right now is that a lot of it comes with funding opportunities. And so I had no idea when I was doing what I was doing when I first started it. When I found out 70% of UNCA students do this, I thought, how are we, you know, but we get an advisor. And so that's what makes the process easier. And it's a great learning um, experience. And as Dr. Underhill mentioned earlier, earlier, um, most students don't pursue something like this until graduate school, but our students start this at the undergraduate level. So um, definitely an amazing experience. If I could just add to that, uh, yeah, there are grants and there's a grant application process for both fall and for spring. And then there's a bigger one for summer, uh, which you can get up to $2,500 for. Uh, and that could pay not just for equipment uses, but for uh, just to, to support yourself so that you don't have to do uh, other jobs. And one other thing, if you're interested in kind of looking at what undergraduate research looks like in across the curriculum, you can find the journal online and, you know, you could just browse through them. You could read the actual uh, papers. So if you go to uh, the undergraduate research uh, page at UNC Asheville, you, there's a, a link to the journal and you can click right on the titles and, and read some from your chosen discipline. My cat has strong opinions on that. Uh, 
Um, but that's a good resource. Awesome. Um, so our last question of the night, um, the question is, what is an available course path, for, coursework path for someone who's interested in criminal slash forensic psychology? Megan, can you take that for me? <laughs> no, I'm happy to. Um, we don't have a specific subfield in, in forensic psychology. However, um, echoing something that Linda had said earlier, we do have a number of students who are interested in law and how psychology impacts law and vice versa. And so uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Lawn, actually teaches a course, Psych and Law, um, that's part of our legal studies minor, I believe. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, sort of the gateway course for people that are interested in that field. They would kind of pursue looking at um, something like that. Maybe politics in the mind. I don't know if that covers something that would be related to that. But if you're interested in that, um, please feel free to contact Dr. Lawn. She was our former chair. She's, she's happy to extol the virtues of the department. And I'm sure she would love to talk about her work. One of her areas of research is um, death penalty, uh, sort of, the, you know, I don't, I don't think she's associated with the Innocence Project, but her goal is to work with um, groups that are trying to uh, help uh, remove people from death row who might be innocent. So um, that is something that is definitely in her interests. So um, we do have somebody in our department who does have an interest in that field, and that's, that's a good beginning. And we also offer criminology courses in sociology. So um, we have a really wonderful, um, very highly praised professor named Professor Mangone, who um, was also a lawyer herself. And she teaches courses in criminology, um, juvenile delinquency, um, and, and several other criminal justice courses. Um, last semester, she even started a, a really cool project where um, it was a community engaged project where it was a criminal justice course, but students were also working with Pisgah Legal Services, um, and they were helping people, again, um, with uh, <laughs> helping them to not get evicted from their homes. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's late in the day and I'm having trouble thinking of the words here, but um, great course, students loved it. They would spend about two hour, um, 10 hours a week at Pisgah Legal, um, helping lawyers there and um, the other folks who are working there work with, with clients, so um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually one of those former students. I love Professor Mangone and the courses. I love juvenile delinquency and um, the um, sociology of law. And so there's definitely a lot of options there for students uh, really interested in that criminal criminology path. Yeah, so we're going to close off today. I do want to say that um, there are a few questions that we did not get to answer that are relevant to other departments, such as housing, financial aid, and campus recreation. I encourage you to join us for our upcoming Q&A sessions that focus on those topics. Next week, Tuesday's topic will be on-campus housing and dining, and Thursday will be natural sciences, and that's Tuesday, March 8th, and Thursday, March 10th, both at 7 p.m. You can view the upcoming sessions and register here. I'm adding that in the chat, but if you're here, then you definitely get emails like that. So, um, but you can use that link or you can look forward to your emails. Um, the other thing I do so also hope that you um, join us for our upcoming admitted students days. Those are March 19th and April 9th. So if March 19th does not work for you, we hope that you can join us April 9th. Keep an eye out on your email and we will send those invites out via email. Um, I will also enter my contact information um, as the admissions counselor here. If you contact me with any questions at all, I will be happy to direct you to any one of our um, panelists here this, after, this evening, not afternoon. <laughs> um, and any final words for the good of the order? Panelists, no? Thank you for hosting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go thank Bulldogs. You. Yes, go Bulldogs. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye.